to live in Madison County too long without hearing about the massacre at least. Um, 13 men and boys shot for supporting the Union during the Civil War. Uh, and for years, I would see this, uh, the marker as I went out to visit friends in Laurel, or I would drive, drive past Colonel Allen's house in downtown Marshall and think, yeah, war, Civil War, right? It was just not something I, I was connected to somehow. I grew up in Florida, my family were from Alabama, uh, no one ever talked about the Civil War. It was just not a matter of discussion in my family, so it was not something I thought about. But after living in Marshall long enough, or in Madison County long enough, and realizing this terrible thing that had happened, I decided I needed to write about it, to write about it and started do, doing research that I found out more about how the whole thing started what the, what the root causes of this massacre were. Um, I have five different characters speaking throughout this mm -hmm. book, because I tried to get people from both sides. And I'll start off with Judy Shelton, uh, who is still remembered out in Shelton Laurel. This is Judy talking 40 years after the massacre. You want to know the way of it? What it was led to the hangings and the whippings? The massacre and the killings that went on after that, folks still getting even not 40 years on. I reckon most would tell you they knew who was in the right and who was in the wrong. And I reckon as you'd ask five different folks to witness, you'd get five different stories. As for me, I ain't so sure. I've waited most of my life for God Almighty to speak unto me and explain it all. Maybe lean out from a dark thundercloud and roar down a mighty pronouncement or speak in tongues of fire from a bright red maple in the fall, or maybe just whisper in my ear on a still and starry night. I have listened and prayed and listened some more, and here it is a new century, but he ain't spoke to me, not once. Just now, I remember thinking, when they came upon us back in 18 and 63, and I felt the rough bite of the rope around my neck and hearkened to the cruel sound of the whip the weeping of the women, and the whimper of Mary Shelton's babe, just now, I thought, would be a good time for him to commence. All I know is that war cast a long shadow, both in the coming and the going of it, and we ain't out of that shadow yet, not by a long shot. The hunger and the hangings and that terrible day, red blood on the white snow and the black wings of them crows, it don't hardly bear thinking of, but it's every bit of it in my memory yet. And I ain't the only one out there, what remembers? Some say all this meanness came upon us in Laurel, began back in 61, when Neely Tweed went after Sheriff Ransom Pleasant Merrill with a double barrel shotgun, went after him and killed him dead over there in the county seat. I don't know, it could be, but I reckon it goes a ways farther back. Likely Brother Norton would say all the long, sorry way back to Cain and Abel. So who was this Neely Tweed, and why did he shoot the sheriff on voting day in Marshall? Well, Neely Tweed was a county justice, a man of some importance in the county, and he was a supporter of the union, and he was related to most of Shelton Laurel, who, and the folks in Shelton Laurel were all unionists. On the day the vote about secession was being taken in Marshall, Sheriff Ransom Pleasant Merrill, a secessionist, turned away the Unionist men from Laurel and wouldn't let them vote. They had written in from Laurel precisely because they wanted to vote against secession and the sheriff wouldn't let them vote. Neely Tweed, who had previously accused the sheriff of some underhanded dealings of one kind or another, um, confronted him. Sheriff Merrill, and by all accounts, he was drunk, raised his pistol and shot at Tweed but missed him and wounded his son. In my novel, Polly Allen, the wife of Colonel Allen, who was an officer in the fledgling Confederate Army, and whose house you have seen probably in downtown Marshall, it's blue now, um, Polly witnesses what happens, watching from that very house, and this was when the reality came to me, you know, looking at that house and thinking, right there, that's where it happened. Um, the whole drama played out there, the and the sheriff's words are taken from the historical record. 
And when I quote the sheriff, or when I have the sheriff speaking. Okay, Polly, from behind, this is Polly speaking, from behind the parlor curtains, I watched the scene in the street. A rough looking group of unionists, savages indeed, with unkempt hair and menacing demeanor, advance upon the sheriff and his supporters. Harsh shouts for the union, answering huzzas for Jeff Davis. As the rabble closes in, I see the sheriff pull out his gun and cry out, you damn black Republicans and Lincolnites. There is a great scuffle between the two factions and unbelieving, I press my hand to my mouth and watch in dismay as the two sides hustle and jostle for preeminence. A shot and then another shot ring out and I hear the tinkle of glass as one of the side lights of our front door shatters. I am frozen with fear, cannot move, cannot indeed even take a breath. In the dust of the street, I see a fallen body, a young man, hardly more than a boy, clutching a bleeding arm, and Sheriff Merrill standing nearby, pistol in hand. Cousin James is quick to come to the young man's aid, and as he kneels there in the dust in the street by the wounded youth, an older man, perhaps the father of the fallen one, emerges from the group of unionists. He carries a shotgun, which he raises to his shoulder as he approaches. Without ceremony, Sheriff Merrill takes to his heels. I watch in horror as he clatters up our steps, bursts through our door, and brushing against my skirts, makes for the stairs, heedless of my astonished presence. Hmm. Fearful for what might follow, I slam shut the front door. Above, I hear the terrified children calling for me, and then the sheriff shouts, Come up here, all you damn black Republicans, and take a shot about with me. I am turning from the door, all amazed when I hear another gunshot, deeper, louder this time. And I'll let James Keith take up the story. He is the doctor who is tending to the wounded boy in the street. Um, he is a cousin of Polly's, of Polly's husband, and he will be second in command of the 64th, which Polly's husband will command. James Keith speaks. I might have known what was afoot when I saw Neely Tweed, one of our county's justices, in close conference with a group of Laurel Unionists. His wife is related to half of them and no doubt emboldened by their presence. Neely has chosen this day, of all days, to address old grievances with the sheriff. My friend Merrill was already in a dangerous mood when the, due to the unexpected number of Union supporters who have turned out to vote for their delegate. From the angry words I heard exchanged just before the shooting, I can only surmise that Merrill meant to shoot the father and, impaired by liquor, hit the son. I stand to look about and assess the situation. Pandemonium reigns. The street is like an angry hornet's nest, a buzz of mindless malevolence. A tall bay, spooked by the gunfire, has pulled loose from the hitching post beside the covered house and canters toward us, reigns trailing. Men scatter, and I wave my hat to turn the beast away from young Tweed. By now, the more timid citizens have sought the refuge of the nearby stores, but most of the voters gathered here today are transfixed by the drama playing out before them. Sheriff Merrill is leaning out from the upper gallery of, Uncle, of Cousin Lawrence's house, haranguing Tweed and the Lincolnites. I see that some of them have found the town constable and are urging him to arrest the sheriff for shooting young Tweed. And then I hear another shot, the unmistakable boom of double barrel shotgun. Real Mer Merrill reels and slumps against the railing, while below Neely Tweed, father of the wounded Elisha, prepares to reload his shotgun. As best I can tell, he was using birdshot, which at this distance means Merrill cannot be seriously injured. Neely, I call to him, keeping my distance, while as he shakes the powder into the muzzle and rams home a wad, Neely, your boy is not much wounded. Don't make matters worse by shooting the sheriff in cold blood. See, the constable is coming to take him into custody. This is a matter for the law. <coughs> he turns an icy blue eye on me. The high sheriff is the law, and it was him that shot my boy. Everyone knows the quarrels betwixt me and Merrill. I called him out on his underhanded jailings, and he shot my boy out of pure meanness. For God's sake, man, I plead, stand aside and let the court and justice deal with this. Justice? Mm -hmm. Tweed all but spits the word at me and reaches for the leather shot pouch at his side. What kind of justice is there for me and mine here in Marshall? We come here to cast our votes against secession, 
And them fellas are trying to prevent us. So that, that is the situation back in 1861, two years before the massacre. Two years for all that bitterness to fester. Folks don't forget. Folks have long memories. There had always been a division between the more prosperous and in some cases the slave-holding people of Marshall and the fiercely independent, non-slave-holding people of Shelton Laurel. The people of Shelton Laurel, by the way, traced their land back uh, to a land grant run by Roderick Shelton for the service, his service in the Revolutionary War at Kings Mountain. These people refused to betray the country their ancestor had helped to found. Yet on the other side, and there's always another side, isn't there? Many in the South spoke of secession as a second revolution, a second war for independence, and felt that they were the patriots defending their homeland. Of course, what they were also defending is the indefensible institution of slavery. We can't forget that, though many of them would like to. Uh, so many of the slaveholders of the time spoke of their servants and the roles in the census. You'll see servant, uh, and then later on you'll find out that servant was actually uh, an enslaved person. This conundrum, though, two sides, each believing their side is right. Um, it, as the war dragged on and the Confederacy began to conscript men, the men, the men of Shelton Laurel were targets. Some were conscripted and deserted. Some, when they deserted, uh, joined the Union forces in Tennessee. Uh, some just hid out in the Laurel Valley. And when Allen's forces would ride into the Laurel Valley in search of the deserters or trying to conscript people, find every tree and every bush, there might be a bushwhacker, someone shooting at them as they rode in. Uh, a Laurel man defending his way of life, his home. Uh, these two sides, each believing they're right, seems especially relevant in the politics of today. As I researched and wrote and researched some more, I realized I really needed to tell both sides, uh, which is why my book is told by five different characters. Two from the Confederate side, Polly Allen, the, the wife of the commander of the 64th, and uh, James Keith, the second in command. Uh, the other side are people from Laurel or a young man who gets caught up in this who is conscripted. They're not so much unionist as the just leave me alone. They just don't want any part of it. But because they don't support the Confederacy, they are assumed to be unionist. Uh, Judy and Polly and Keith, who you've heard from already, are based on real people. And I tried to stay with the facts uh, when telling their stories. Of course I made up what I thought they were thinking and feeling, uh, but if somebody moves here or goes there, I had to be true to that. I couldn't just send Polly off to Paris at some point to get away from everything. <laughs> I tried to stay with what actually happened in her life. Uh, then the other two characters, Sim and Marthy. Uh, Sim is completely fictional. Uh, he is like so many who were caught up in this war. He is a conscript, he will become a conscript into the Confederate Army. We first meet him at an inn on the Trovers Road, uh, not too far from here, actually. Uh, he had been at Garrett's Inn, which was here in Hot Springs, or Warm Springs at the time. He had been at Garrett's Inn the night before, and he's at another place uh, right now. Only last night, when our wagon train put up at Garrett's Inn near Warm Springs, we had heard something of Sumter and the cry of war. A fellow there had a Tennessee newspaper and he was full, full of talk about South Carolina taking the fort from the Union soldiers. There is always folks eager to tell the latest news whenever we stop at an inn. So I already knew that sometime back of this, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, maybe Texas, along with several others, had voted to leave the Union. Why well, even knew they had elected a feller named of Jeff Davis to be the head of them. But I haven't paid it much mind, figuring it wouldn't change my life none. My life is set and arranged according to the seasons. In the spring and summer of the year, I go with a wagon train on the Buncombe Turnpike, carrying goods between Greenville and Tennessee and Greenville and South Carolina. 
Come fall, I follow the droves of hogs along the same roads where the packed dirt tows to a stinking slough of mud and hogshed. Hard, dirty work, but in a few more years and I'll have enough saved to buy me a place near Maryville in Tennessee where chorus people are. And then I'll turn farmer and my life will still run according to the seasons. That's what he thinks. He uh, ends up being inscripted into the uh, 64th. Marthy, my fifth main character, is based on a name from the records. Uh, she is listed as one of the women tortured by the, colonel, the soldiers of Colonel Allen 64, and she is described in the records as an idiot girl. Now, at this remove, I had no idea what that meant. You know, um, I decided to make her not an idiot, but a mute. And someone, for some unspecified reason, cannot speak, but she can think and she can witness. Uh, she doesn't speak in the book, but she, she, we, we hear her thoughts. Uh, I took the liberty, since I could not find anything about her in the records, beyond the fact that she was married briefly and then was living with her parents again, and then she disappears. Uh, I took the liberty of treating her as a fictional character, uh, making her a mute, uh, and fashioning a bit of a love story around her. See, I'm trying to turn just the story of the massacre into a novel. There has to be more than just the, the, the bare facts. So Sim and Marthy allowed me to um, play around with, with that a bit. Um, back to the cause of the massacre, though. I've told you about the bad blood between the Union's folk and the Confederates of Marshall, the conscription and the bushwhacking. And as the war ground down and supplies were ever shorter here in the mountains, salt became a com precious commodity and the Confederates and Marshall controlled it. They would not allow known or suspected Unionists to buy any. And salt was vital, not in the least because of the necessity of using it to preserve your meat, your hot pig meat, your beef, whatever, your whatever. Uh, people from Laurel went into Marshall and were turned away, were not allowed to buy any salt. In January of 1863, a band of men rode from Laurel into Marshall and raided the salt depot. They also raided stores and homes, including that of Colonel Allen, who was stationed in Knoxville at the time. Polly was there alone, but for a servant, caring for her three children who were desperately ill with scarlet fever. According to the accounts of the time, the raiders came in and took even the blankets from the children's beds. As with the killing of the sheriff, Polly is a witness. The next time you're in Marshall, look at that Allen house and imagine what it would be like to see those soldiers coming up, coming up your doorstep. I lock and bolt the front door and lean against it, almost unable to breathe. It is my old nightmare, war at my gate. And now boots are on the porch and the door light rattles against my hand. Shit far, looks like ain't nobody to home, growls a drunken voice almost at my ear. Well, maybe you not got to knock louder, Joe, another says. Could be old Alan's wife's already in bed. The ensuing laughter and crude talk chill me to the marrow. These animals, these savages, I dart to the fireplace and take up the poker just as the parlor window shatters into a thousand pieces. The glass lies all around me, sparkling in the firelight, and I feel a tiny trickle of blood run down my cheek where a flying splinter is lodged. Half dazed, I stand there, poker raised as a huge man with a matted beard and long, unruly locks and beneath his hat steps through the window frame. He regards me with amusement as I brandish the little poker before me and squeak out a warning. A quick step forward and he has seized it and twisted it from my hands. Come on in, boys, he calls. The Colonel's woman is to home, after all. I say, next time you're in Marshall, just imagine that scene right there, that house. Um, soon after this, Polly's husband, who is stationed in Knoxville, is directed to travel back to, Mar to Laurel and find those responsible for the raid on the salt depot. 
uh, he has heard something of uh, the break-in into his house, but not much. Uh, he leads his troop into Laurel for a house-to-house -house search, looking for salt, looking for the men who perpetrated the raid. His second in command is James Keith, and I'll let Keith tell this bit. The driving snow has hampered our advance, as has the knowledge that sniper fire can come from behind any rock or tree. The men have taken some slight injuries, and I myself have had my hat knocked off by a ball from an unseen musket. But we have accounted for a round dozen of the traitors, and our blood is up. The frostbite has taken a severe toll. The men are eager for revenge. Eager to, as I heard one corporal assert, wipe ever less one of those homegrown Yankees off the face of the earth. The meager little farmsteads are set far apart, and it's a slow business to enter and search each one and question the women. For men, there are none, save for a daughtery graybeard or two. And to a woman, they bow. They know nothing of any salt and that their men are away in the army or hunting. We upend their paltry households, but find no more than scant leavings of salt. Yet bushels and bushels were taken in the martial raid, and those bushels must be somewhere. I'm in the midst of interrogating a snaggletooth harridan whom I would have taken to be 60 or more, but for the child she held, snuffling and rooting at her opulent breast. Hard-eyed and silent, she watched as my men tore apart her corn shut tick, then climbed into the cabin loft where they rummaged noisily for a time, only to emerge, shaking their heads and munching on withered apples from the barrel they overturned in seeking the plundered salt. From upstairs come cries of children, wailing that the secesh have stolen their apples, and for a moment I see the hag's lips tremble. I am about to press on with my questions when I hear the beat of hoes on the ground outside and the thump of boots at the door. I am surprised to see Lawrence looking ravaged and as near to frantic as ever I have seen him. He jerks his head, motioning me outside. It was good luck I saw your men as we came along. I would sent word to your encampment, but I may as well apprise you of the situation. Word has come that my children are desperately ill. The message went first to Knoxville and has been some days getting to me. I am on my way to Marshall with a party of riders. Pray God I am not too late. I say all the appropriate things about his children and assure him that I shall carry on here to the best of my abilities. Do that, Jim, he says, clasping my shoulder. Root out those beasts. I will be back as soon as I can. I walk with him to his horse and watch as he and his party clatter away across the hard frozen ground. My heart lifts and before I turn back to the cabin, I call to one of the men standing guard to find a likely tree and cut some rods, such as one uses on recalcitrant children. Now that I am in charge, I believe we can take sterner measures. Those sterner measures Mock hangings, they put ropes around the women, dragged them up to the tree till they were just barely balancing on their tiptoes. Uh, whippings, uh, they whipped one old woman till the blood showed through, through her dress. Uh, they took one woman's baby, tossed it out in the snow, and told her they were gonna leave it there if she didn't tell where her husband was or where the salt was. Uh, it, but no one told anything, no one, most of them, many of them did not know, did not know where the men were, uh, did not know where the salt was, and others of them just resolved not to say anything. And it may have been just frustration that caused Keith just to go out and round up basically a random 13 men. A few of them had deserted from the 64th, and so he, they were known to him, but the rest, from an old man to a boy 13 years old, he just rounded up, I don't know, it must have been about 15 of them, and took them, took them to Judy Shelton's cabin. Uh, the chimney of that ca cabin still stands out in Shelton Laurel. Uh, it's, it's fascinating to me that it has endured. They took them and held them there overnight. Uh, they, the men were told they would be taken to either Tennessee or Marshall for a trial and a jail. Uh, Marthy will tell this part that night in the cabin.
There's a stomping of boots outside and the door busts open. The big sergeant is standing there and he tells Judy they're going to use her house to hold some prisoners overnight. What prisoners are you talking about, says she. Well, some of the black scoundrels who did the mischief in Marshall, he says, and jerks his head at the open door. Outside, six CSESH soldiers, rifle guns at the ready, are guarding a bunch of our men who are standing there with their hands tied behind their backs, looking cold and tired. I recognize them all, a bunch of Sheltons, William and Azariah and Roderick and Old David, along with Palin and Henry Moore, and, and I see Jim Metcalf and Ellison King crowded up next to Joe Woods and the Chandler boy, I think his name is Jasper. In, in the back of the gang stands Johnny Norton, shivering and looking scared to death, and behind him, I am surprised to see Pete McCoy, who is grinning like this is all a joke. And then I see Davy's father, and his big brother, and I can't hardly catch my breath. Judy goes to the door and looks out. What are you doing with these fellows, and most of them little more than boys, or men not able to fight? Ain't none of them had everything to do with taking that song. It was all Union soldiers what rode into Marshall that night. The big sergeant rounds on her, starting like an angry dog. I can tell you this, you homegrown Yankee bitch, some of these men is deserters. King and Woods there, and them two Moorses all run from the 64th, run like the cowards they are, they'll pay for it, whether they was part of the thieving or no. So they all get taken into the cabin, spend the night there, and the next day they are marched away. They think they're going to Tennessee, but it's just a few miles away. They are stood up beside a ditch and shot by a firing squad from the 64th. Shot and tossed in a ditch and a little few rocks, a little bit of dirt tossed over them. Um, the pleas of the prisoners are on record and in writing about the massacre, I use their own heartbreaking words. Don't shoot me in the face. Boys, would you shoot your old comrade? You know, uh, won't you give us time to pray? It's, uh, these people used to be neighbors. These people used to know each other. Um, as word of this incident made its way to the out outside world, it became known as a massacre. And even the Confederate government condemned Keith's action. Uh, still, he and some others, uh, and even today, some others, say this is just, this is war, this is what happens. It wasn't a massacre, it was an act of war. As I wrote and researched, uh, I didn't want to end with the massacre. I wanted to talk about that long shadow that Judy talked about, the long shadow that war cast. What happened to these folks after the massacre? And as I wrote and researched, I had found some surprising things about um, some of these people. Uh, I, I had an email from Colonel Keith's granddaughter, great, great granddaughter, who said she wanted me to be aware that he ended up his life in Arkansas, uh, a pillar of the community, well-respected, a pillar of the church, uh, etc. And she said, I hope you'll be fair to him. So all the way through, this is what I was trying to do. I was trying to be fair to people, trying to uh, imagine how they felt, imagine what what their feelings were as they did these things. So there's a lot of what I think, uh, but it's all on a skeleton of the real facts. Uh, the story doesn't end, as I say. The resentments and the killings went on earning our county the name Bloody Madison. Uh, as Judy said in the prologue, war cast a long shadow. But I'll leave the last word with Judy. Uh, her legacy and her descendants are still strong in Shelton Laurel yes. and beyond. She, she turned out to be my very favorite character the more I read about her. Folks tell stories and pass along what they heard, and some is actual and some is, well, I'll not say lies, but two people can remember the same thing in two right different ways. I think I remember the way of things, though after so many years I ain't sure. But sometimes they get a true memory, true as ever was, and time twists around on me, and I am back with Abner when he first come home from the war. It is a hazy afternoon, and he has sent word to meet him in the little hidden cove where that big shagmark hickory stands. It was our special place long ago, and I am ready and more to lay down with him, maybe make another yeoman. 
It seems to me this is the only th worth th thing worth doing, blue or gray, Union or Confederate. Ain't neither of them mattered a lick. What mattered then and what still and always matters is the land and the people to work it, the broad fields and the pastures, the rich soil, the creeks, the rivers, the deep woods, the land that makes us make a crop, the land that gives us life. I reach the meeting place early and stretch out on the long summer grass, all a quiver with thinking of Abner and the sweet feel of him. My eyes grow heavy as the sun washes over me. My limbs are loose and my breath is coming fast. I hear the sound of his horse, but I keep my eyes shut. Through my eyelids, I see little dots of sunlight, then a shadow falls across me. Judy, he says, and I feel his fingers trailing down my face and opening the buttons of my shirt waist. Judy, he says again, his breath in my ear and his weight on me. Judy, he says a third time as he pulls my skirt aside. I claw my fingers into the rich woods dirt of this holy ground and look up at the blue sky beyond Abner's head. This, I think, this. And that's it. I would be happy to answer any questions. out here, out there. <laughs> exactly where did the massacre happen? Did it happen where, 20, where 208 tees with 212? Uh, I don't think so. There are several, like she says, ask five different people to get five different answers. And I, I had several different answers from the various people. I'm thinking it's at the turn to Hickey's Fork, mm -hmm. right, right there. But, I'm not sure. I could not find any, any, does anyone here have any clear notion of where it was? Trish? Well, thanks for putting me on the fly. <laughs> um, having lived all my life, almost uh, childhood life, about a half mile from where they're actually buried, the thing I always heard was it was close to where Bellevue intersects there, okay. to wait. Um, intersects there, but just back up. I don't know if y'all know familiar with the log house that's on the right over near the, the creek there. Just up past that, just a little bit, is where I always grew up hearing it was. But who knows? Yeah. Um, yeah I had so many different stories. I, I settled on in my mind <coughs> getting the, I believe it's Mickey's Fork turn off, uh, because a friend of mine was driving out there and she said she had some sort of shaman in the car with her and he said stop and he got to that point he said something horrible happened here and he leaped out and did smudge and stuff and I thought well okay I'll, I'll go with that. Yeah. Uh, I guess demographics. Do you know how many free people at that time lived in Madison County? How many slaves and how many slave owners? I do not know. I do not know. There were more in Mars Hill uh, even Colonel Allen, in looking at the census rolls, he lists a servant, but then I think somewhere she is listed as black. And I have, in, my, in writing about it, I just tried to be ambiguous. Polly refers to as a servant, which many people did, refer to their slaves as servants. Um, I could not find, and that was not actually a part of what I was writing about, um, because uh, the people who lived in Marshall, if they had enslaved people, it was probably, if they had any number of them, it was probably on a farm somewhere, and Keith had a farm over near Mars Hill. So I'm thinking he probably had some, but I, I did not try to find out for sure. Thank you. Yeah. I have a question. I'm, I'm interested in the significance of the crows, just in general. Lover. Oh, the significance of the crows in the book. And I'm just wondering how that shows up. The crows in your title. Yes, thank you. The, the, crow, crow, the crow. The crow. The crow. The crow. Oh, this beautiful cover. Um, Nancy Durrell, who lives in Shelton World, uh, does woodcuts. And when my publisher was looking for a cover, <clears throat> I, I said, you know, something with crows maybe. And she sent me a bunch of yucky looking pictures. And I looked at Nancy's website. And she had this gorgeous woodcut, which I thought was just perfect. And she just very kindly consented to let me use it. So um, 
I, I love it. The title, the book was originally going to be titled, That Was the Way of It, and the publisher said, this is just too bland. And so then I said, well, how about In My Memory Yet, which is a line from the song Lorena, which is all through this story. It was a popular song on both sides of the war, uh, In My Memory Yet, and that was, that was okay, but not very good. And then at some point I just thought, have the crows took their eyes? <laughs> oh, that's just too ghastly. <laughs> but I mentioned it to my editor and she loved it. So uh, I don't know if the title has turned off some people, kept them from buying it, but um, I thought it was just absolutely appropriate for this, this horrible thing. Well, it's such a dark story and crows kind of per, you know, kind of, when you see a crow, you think, ooh. <laughs> you know, I'm very it, fond of crows, but yeah. that was part of the, <clears throat> in the, in the, uh, in the historical records, uh, the bodies that were tossed in the ditch were found the next day and the crows and the hogs, hogs ran loose, had been at them and they were all chewed up and, uh, and the crows had taken their eyes. So that was just, that's, you know, war isn't just bang, you fall down and then you're buried somewhere with a flag. It's horrible. Just horrible. And these were neighbors doing it to each other. Mm -hmm. That's what, that was the, the mm -hmm. deepest horror of it all. Right. Uh, did the militia go up specifically because of the theft of the salt? And do we know who gave the order to shoot them? I did not understand that. I'm sorry. Really loud. I am so Did the militia go up because of the salt being stolen specifically? Or was yes. it also related to the fact that they were avoiding the, uh, conscription? And also, who gave the order to shoot them? <clears throat> okay, um, the militia, uh, it wasn't the militia, it was the 64. They went into the Laurel uh, specifically because of the salt raid to find where the salt had gone and to catch get the people who had uh, perpetrated this raid. Before this, they had been back and forth in Laurel looking for deserters. And so while they were there looking for the people involved in the salt raid, they were also going to um, find deserters, and they did. Uh, who gave the order to shoot? Uh, it was evidently Keith. Keith is the one who, in the aftermath of all of this, is charged both by the Confederate government uh, and then later when the war is over, by the federal government. He is charged with perpetrating a massacre. Keith says that General Hepp, who was back in Tennessee, had told them not to take any prisoners. So that was Keith's out. He says, I was you know, just following orders. Um, we'll never know. The thing about research at this, you can't trust the newspapers of the time. You can't trust the census, everything contradicts everything, but the most, the con what I went with generally was the consensus. The consensus of uh, study seems to be that Keith uh, gave the order for the massacre. He was, uh, Allen was back in Marshall, uh, Keith was in charge. Uh, there is, in the telling of after the, um, after they're shot, there in the record there is this story of a one of the soldiers dancing on the body saying pat juba while i dance them down to hell uh and i include that and i make that same soldier the villain of um something earlier i, I felt free to do that so, since he was already so awful um anything else how long did it take you to do your research for this book Oh, about four years. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't, you know, just sitting down every day doing that. But, uh, I would do some research and then I would start writing and then, oh, but now I've got to find out about this. Mm -hmm. And now I've got to find out about this. And I knew so little about the Civil War uh, and how things were organized. So I had to find out how did they organize the troops, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and what I, I became very interested in was the, the, really the minutia, the stuff like there's a chapter of Polly and some of the ladies of Marshall uh, making bandages, uh, scraping lint. This
this was something I'd always heard of bandage rolling societies mm -hmm. and never quite understood that. And then as I did research, it was incredibly necessary mm -hmm. what these women did because uh, the army did not have, uh, the Confederate army did not have the supplies they would need uh, for all the wounded. And so here are these ladies carrying up their linen sheets and tablecloths to make bandages. Uh, and so I, I spent, you know, days studying this, which I just found fascinating. Was it challenging for you to tell both sides of the story? Uh, not really. Once I get into someone's head, yeah. I mean, I, I ended up, Keith was sort of the villain of the piece, mm -hmm. but I ended up sort of excusing him in a way as far as, okay, he's caught up in the war. Uh, his nephew was killed by one of the bushwhackers in Laurel. So I make that sort of a part of his, you know, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. why he did what he did. Mm -hmm. um, I became fond of all of them. Uh, fonder of Judy than anyone. Yes. But, um, yes. and Sim, Sim, who is not real, uh, I became very fond of him. But, yeah, it, once I had decided I had to tell both sides, I, I had to stop and think, okay, these are not just devils on one side, good right. people here. I have to, I have to think about uh, how they see it. Mm -hmm. And Polly allows me to talk about her husband. She talks about how he is feeling about things. Mm -hmm. And um, he ends up, his story is really tragic as I did more research and found out what happened to him. It was very sad. Uh, he had been the sort of the golden boy, uh, and he was elected to head the 64, and he had he had been county clerk. Uh, and after the massacre, though it was Keith who was charged with it, um, Allen never really quite recovered. Mm -hmm. And what I read about his later life is just really sad. And so I have Polly reflecting on that. And at some point, toward the end, she says. It's just like, it's like little boys, like little boys out there waving their swords around, saying, Mama, see me, see me. And so I give her, you know, who knows what she really thought, but that's what I decided to see that from her point of view. Like, the, the Unionists up there in Laurel, they were certainly a tough lot. Uh, the, uh, did they not try uh, any retribution against this massacre, there were no shootings out Oh, heavens, Keith oh, was in jail in Buncombe County. Uh, he was charged, he was tried, I don't know, a number of times. They tried him for each murder separately, each, each person. But they didn't try to go and kill the other, have a, a massacre. Like a vigilante, a vigilante thing. Or revenge kind of oh, was there a retribution for the massacre? Yeah, yeah like, on the part uh, of the unions against the Yeah, most, Pete, Pete McCoy, who escaped the massacre. He, he was one of those rounded up and in Judy's cabin, but he went out uh, call of nature with a guard and never came back. And they were, it was said that he and the guard were both Masons and the guard let him go. Uh, that's what was said. But anyway, he is still around and he carried on a kind of a one man vendetta you know, going into Asheville, yeah. shooting someone who had been part of this. Uh, he, uh, this is part of the, the yeah. Bloody Madison thing that yeah. went on. And people remember, you know, mm -hmm. who, who did what to whom. And so that went on for a long time. I don't think it's still going on, but it did go on for a long time. Camille. I, I think very interesting Then you put the, the girl then cannot talk. Uh, I am fascinated that you did put this in, in a book because I think it's very pertinent with the people in Madison County. Uh, the, the mute character. She yes. thought that was very interesting yes. to have the girl who was mute as oh. a, a character in the book. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I think that was very, very important for me in a, in a story. I, I, I liked it. Um, as I say, it gave me a chance to... Um, graft on a little story uh, mm -hmm. using a real person uh, and she to me was a very 
very charming person. You know, I had no idea what the real person was like, but um, I, I really mm -hmm. to just love her. Talk loud. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, me too. But uh, I had always been told that Alan had a child that died mm -hmm. during them going in and getting the Hescarlic fever, and that one of his children died uh, when they'd taken the blankets, and he blamed that on the people who had been coming. Did you see any of that in the research? Um, I think definitely. The children, the, the two children who died after the blankets were taken away, um, certainly would have given Keith a free, although Keith didn't know at the moment that the children had died, um, but it certainly would have enhanced the way Keith and Alan felt about the Confederate. It was evidently not men from Laurel or it was men from Laurel, but who, men from Laurel who were currently serving in the Union Army, who were home on leave, and it was, it was they who rode in to Marshall and took the salt. At least that's the way I tell it. Um, that's what some authorities say. So they say, this, it's so hard uh, at, this, at this remove in time to know for sure what really happened. Mm -hmm. um, I'm working trying to tell a good story I'm trying to be as faithful to facts mm -hmm. as I can find facts. Yes. yes. But the facts are all over the place mm -hmm. sometimes. Mm -hmm. But um, but yeah, I think I think what happened to the children certainly would have influenced Alan's feelings later on. What was the outcome of the Confederate and federal charges against them? Um, the outcome was that Keith had friends who helped him escape. He escaped from Buncombe County Jail and made his way to Arkansas, where he lived a long and prosperous life. Mm -hmm. It's one of those things like, here is the worst one, the worst guy of the group, and he ends up the best off. Uh, but that's what happened. Mm -hmm. he, uh, he had people who helped him escape. And uh, I try to imagine that escape in the book. It's, it's not fair. Life is never fair. One of the, the thing about your book that absolutely intrigued me so much was we didn't necessarily need the logistics, but you showed the human side. You showed the suffering on mm -hmm. both sides. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. and, and again, I come, I come from a family, unfortunately, who had slaves at that time. And they ran for years trying to hide it, you know. But you showed the dilemma, especially Polly, I hurt every time I read that part about her. Um, she was caught in the middle, you know, and she, it seems like from your writing, she was a good person. Not that someone that wasn't, you know, but it, it's just, for me, I could find myself and crying sometimes as I read the book because you showed the human side of conflict. Well, I have never been a great reader of Civil War novels because I'm not into reading about battles mm -hmm. and such. Um, and, and that's not what I set out to write. I did want to write about how it affected the people. Mm -hmm. And Polly, to me, uh, right at first, when they hear the band playing mm -hmm. and people are signing up and it, they say, oh, it'll be over in no time, she's very optimistic. Oh, we'll be two great nations side by side. She has this, you know, mm -hmm. it's going to be fine. And then when things start going badly, she is, you know, just destroyed her husband, she has to support her husband, and this is true to the very end. Uh, she has to support her husband uh, in whatever he does, and she is such a good wife and such a good mother, but uh, her, what happens to her is so sad because of what has happened to her husband. By the end, he is, he is just a shell of his former self, uh, and he, he sort of, Reliving his, what he thinks of him as glory days, mm -hmm. and she mm -hmm. sees what it's all come to, which is not much. You know, I never, I just thought about this when you were talking. You know, a lot of times people will say, oh, you're a Pollyanna, and they see that as a, a fault instead of being a peacekeeper. So how ironic 
Her name is Polly, and she's fulfilling that beautiful role of being fair I think so. and optimistic. Yeah. Uh, she just she is doing the best she can in a really horrible situation. Um, I, here again, I don't know anything more about her. I, <clears throat> I assume she had had some education. Mm -hmm. uh, she talks about having read Sir Walter Scott, mm -hmm. uh, and I think in reading about her, I found she had had some education. And somebody said once that you know your people, your Keith and Alan and Polly speak so so flowery, and I said I have read letters by people of the time who are not educated beyond maybe the sixth grade, and they are very flowery. They are, um, a friend, a friend uh, in Tennessee sent me copies of letters, her grandfather, her great-great-grandfather, uh, who was a, a lawyer, had written during the war, and they are just eloquent, um, just amazing. So I felt like I was being true to the way uh, these people would speak. Mm -hmm. uh, Judy character is the most complex because, you know, Polly, uh, I understand what you are saying about, uh, you know, what she's going on, but the character of Judy is so much more complex of what she had to go through her life. Uh, Polly has a rather simple life right. in some ways. Yeah, Judy was fascinating. Um, I, she wasn't even in the book to begin with, and I started doing uh, doing research. Um, uh, Kim Shelton lent me a book about the Sheltons, and I started, you know, checking out mm -hmm. all the people. And Judy Shelton <clears throat> had I don't know thirteen children and was never married, yes, which amazing. sort of surprised me. Well, uh, and then I started thinking she had uh, a bunch by um, Saul Chanley and the bunch more by Abner Tweed, and, but never married. Mm -hmm. And I don't know her reasoning here, but I choose to believe she didn't want to marry because if she married, the farm that she owned, she, owned, she uh -huh. inherited the farm she from her it. father. Mm -hmm. The farm would become the property of her husband. Mm -hmm. And so she just chose not to marry. Fantastic. And all her children were named Shelton, uh, rather than Chandley or, or Tweed. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I may be pulling this out of thin air, but that just seemed to me to make yeah. sense. Mm -hmm. And everything I read about her, she was a strong, strong woman. Yes. Um, just, I, I don't know um, what stories have come down about her, but um, I, I really, really liked her. And she was, she was so take charge. Yeah, feminist before her time. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. So it's absolutely. it's fascinating. Yes. Yeah, when she when she suggests to the women who have been left widows hmm. that uh, they need children to work their farms, and they said, "Well, my man's dead," and she said, "Look at me. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to be married to have a have children." And um, I, I had this idea. Um, friends took me to. Um, to talk to uh, David Shelton, I believe it was, uh -huh. and he told me some stories, and one was that after the war, there were so few men, there were a few old men who went from house to house as needed, what? and uh, <coughs> all the South, <coughs> the women managed to keep on having children. That's so uh, biblical. To, um, to Cycle <laughs> uh, 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 I just love this story. It's like Lot and his daughters in the Bible. Well, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank you all for coming out on this beautiful Saturday and joining us for Vicki. And thank you very much for coming over. We so appreciate it. Thank you, Sue, for this beautiful space. Um, we're going to feature another author here in April. Um, Mark Pinsky is going to be here. Um, and Elmer Hall will be interviewing Mark's him, our wow. local oh, Elmer cool. Hall. So that will be another great opportunity to talk firsthand with an author because that is such a different experience than reading the book. He wrote Better on the Mountain, and that's about the murder of Nancy Morgan. Yeah. Um, so that cool. should be great. So I hope we will see you all here. Um, Mark will be here on the 7th at 6 p.m. 
or in Marshall on the 5th at um, 5 o'clock. So if you drove a little bit, there's another option. Vicki, thank you again for coming here on a Saturday. Thank you. Thanks to all of you. Yes. That is starting with you. I hope you don't mind. And that is we're starting a museum here downstairs. Oh, oh, really that's what I really like is those people who've organized whatever the situation, grouping, whatever, here, uh, as well as the presenter and perhaps a book, and if that's possible. And then all downstairs we will have the history of what I know that is awesome. So anyone who is part of organizing here, please stand and if it's all right, we'll take some photos. Sure. Thank you.